channel on player or playground. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be about football, although talking about the Czech national team and its successes would be an interesting topic for discussion as well, I guess. Uh, nevertheless, the topic of the panel is uh, what role for Czechia in the global economic reordering. So it seems like the global economic order is crumbling. Uh, we are facing a number of challenges and uh, we have a couple of distinguished uh, panelists to talk about these challenges and to talk about the position of our country and other countries in the CE region um, about their position in this whole problem. My name is Michal Parizek. I'm from the Charles University here in Prague. I will be chairing the panel. We have around 90 minutes, uh, which is not enough to even start to scratch the surface of this uh, major agenda, but we will try our best to get some interesting insights and uh, perhaps also policy recommendations from our speakers. Now, the structure and the rules of the panel will be quite simple. Uh, short presentations or short introductory remarks by uh, each of our uh, panelists, which I'm going to introduce in a second. Uh, then uh, some uh, one or two questions from myself, and then we'll open up. We hope for a lively debate on this uh, hot uh, late summer afternoon. Now, let me start with introducing our guests. So, to my, to my right side, uh, we have Professor Dr. Andreas Nolke from Frankfurt University. Um, uh, Andreas is a professor of political science with a focus on international relations and international political economy in Frankfurt. Uh, he works on several research agendas, uh, most notably the Euro and the Euro crisis and the European financial uh, arrangements, then uh, the, the framework of, or the development and, and the application of the framework of the varieties of capitalism, which I guess his uh, talk today will be pretty much based on, and things uh, like the north-south relations in the global economy. So uh, pretty wide, uh, wide scope of agenda, of course. Now to my left, I would like to welcome Françoise Nicolas, uh, Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Center for Asian Studies at the French Institute of International Relations. Uh, she works uh, on, emerging economic, on emerging economies specifically with a focus on East Asia and China uh, and on globalization and its impact on global governance. And uh, of course, uh, she will talk uh, uh, in, her, in her contribution, she will focus specifically on that, on that region. Uh, then on, again on my right side, uh, we have uh, Rudolf Fürst uh, from uh, the Institute of International Relations where he's a senior researcher, again with a focus on China and East Asia, on Czech-Chinese relations and the uh, related agenda, again very deeply connected to what we are going to talk about uh, today on this panel. And last but not least, again on my left side, uh, Vladan Hodulak uh, from the Department of International Relations and European Studies from the Masaryk University in Brno, uh, researching and, uh, and teaching on international political economy, power and international, in international monetary affairs and global governance institutions, and specifically in the economic era. So um, I will not talk any further, I guess. I would just kindly ask, like to kindly ask the speakers to stick to our agreed 10 minutes uh, limit. I'm going to give you a notice uh, two minutes in advance. Uh, and then after we are done with that, I am looking forward for a very lively and open debate of some critical issues in global political economy and the question of uh, Czechia's involvement in global economic relations. So, Andreas, uh, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Michael, for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, from the perspective of uh, political economy, uh, we are living in very exciting times, because uh, for the last about 150 years, the center of the world economy uh, was in uh, North America, Western Europe, and Japan. And we are now living in the period of time where the center of the world economy is moving away uh, from this established uh, uh, tripods uh, of economies and it's moving towards emerging markets. And of course, this is a process that will still take some time, but uh, it's very interesting, of course, for us, also living in Europe, uh, what the future uh, world economic order um, will look like. And um, normally the institutions of the global economic order uh, in a way reflect uh, the, the institutions of the most important economy of the time. So, for example, over the last couple of decades, uh, the global economic order was mainly structured uh, around the so-called Washington Consensus and it was strongly influenced by the US economic order. 
So the interesting question is, um, how will the next economic order look like? And since it will mainly be influenced by economies that we generally call emerging markets, uh, we are studying uh, the economic institutions of emerging markets. In our studies, we have identified two types of capitalism in emerging markets that has, over the last couple of decades, been successful, coherent, and stable. And in my presentation, I will uh, uh, kind of compare and present these two uh, types of uh, emerging market capitalism. Of course, not all emerging markets belong to these two types of capitalism. The one is called dependent capitalism, the other one is called uh, state-permeated capitalism. Uh, there are also a number of emerging markets that are more incoherent and uh, very often get into crisis. Look at the moment at Turkey, Argentina, South Africa and others. However, two um, types of emerging markets have proven to be successful over the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years and I will give you some uh, some data on these two types of economies. Uh, the one type is here in the region. Uh, it's more or less uh, in the, in the Visegrad um, uh, countries. Uh, this is a type of capitalism that we have called uh, dependent market economies. It has uh, led to fairly high economic uh, growth rates over the last uh, couple of uh, uh, decades. And the other one uh, we have called state-permeated market economies, mainly in China and India, uh, to a more limited degree also in uh, Brazil. We have also had a look at South Africa, but it doesn't belong to this category. Uh, as has been introduced by Michael, we are looking at these things from a perspective that is called comparative capitalism, or some of you may know it under the heading of varieties of capitalism. And the latter one uh, is based on a comparison between uh, the liberal economies of the US and the UK uh, and the so-called coordinated market economies uh, of Germany uh, and Japan as a, a successful types of capitalism in the traditional core of the world uh, economy. Um, I will now uh, look at uh, the two types of emerging market capitalism, uh, but I will also give you uh, comparative data for the liberal economies and the coordinated economies. I will progress along the usual uh, institutions of uh, comparative capitalism, which is corporate governance, corporate finance, industrial relations, research and development, um, and uh, the type of integration in the world uh, economy. Starting with corporate governance, um, what is fairly obvious here, here you see uh, a graph, hopefully you can read it, um, that gives uh, the FDI inward stock as percentage of GDP. And you see uh, a strong difference between India and China uh, on the one side, uh, where the economy, you can say, still belongs to the Indian and the Chinese, uh, and uh, to the uh, four Visegrad countries that are very strongly influenced by foreign direct investment. So you can say, well, the economy is very strongly uh, dominated by foreign direct investment by multinational companies from other world regions. Um, so you see why also we have called the Visegrad countries dependent market economies because they are dependent in many cases on decision taken elsewhere in the world. Whereas India and China clearly have a focus on domestic control, uh, domestic capitalists uh, and the state control over their economy. This is not only reflected in uh, uh, in the degree of foreign capital attracted, but it's also uh, reflected in the degree of state control in these economies. And here, uh, the next graph shows um, uh, an indicator that has been compiled by the OECD, an OECD indicator of state control, and it gives, uh, on the one side, uh, public ownership of the economy, and on the other side, all kinds of state involvement of business uh, operations. And again, India and China, China stand out. Uh, maybe surprising to you, India even more than China um, with a high degree of state control. So clearly the state wants to control the fate of the economy. It wants to organize a fairly coherent industrialization catch-up program and other economies. Uh, much lesser degree of state control, um, uh, such as for example the UK uh, and um, again uh, the Eastern European economies are also uh, with the exception of Poland uh, among uh, the less state control. So the idea of the China and India were that we need to keep domestic control of the economy by limiting foreign direct investment and by keeping a strong degree of state control. In line with this specific model, uh, these economies are also very careful not to give uh, too much power to global capital markets. Because global capital markets, as I have, for example, learned during the Asian crisis of 1998, can lead to a situation where you become dependent 
For this reason, they are very uh, reluctant to embrace global capital markets. And uh, the next graph uh, demonstrates where um, money for investment comes from uh, in these uh, countries. And this small black um, uh, column that you see is um, money that is coming from the equity market. You see it's very uh, limited in China and India, whereas it's much more important uh, in, in other economies. So uh, these economies keep, uh, try to keep global capital markets largely out of the end use in the limited ways because I know global capital markets can lead to turbulences, can lead to a situation where you have to go to the IMF, and the IMF uh, imposes uh, certain conditions on you, and you don't want these conditions uh, for the sake of your long term strategy. Um, so money doesn't come from capital markets, but rather from uh, internal funds, retail earnings, and from bank credit. Now, in terms of bank credit, uh, again, uh, for these economies, for China and India, it is extremely important to keep the banks under, under national control. Because only if you have the banks under national control, you can ensure that the banks will lend to the companies, for example, in the situation of crisis. If your banks are making foreign bonds, uh, what can happen to you is that in the situation of crisis, they will withdraw the operations, move to their headquarter country, uh, and your companies will be in trouble. So, what they want you to make look uh, sure is uh, that you have strong domestic control over your the banks. And again, you see India and China have a very high degree uh, of um, bank ownership in these economies, uh, very much to contrast um, to other economies, mostly mass economies, liberal economies, but also the visa economies in the countries, where domestic much less important than uh, foreign banks. Um, the model of these uh, emerging economies so far is largely based um, on, a, um, on a strategy that is uh, based on fairly low wages. Um, this is increasing, particularly in China, uh, but wages are still much lower than, uh, in, of course, established economies and, and the dependent market economies in Central Eastern Europe wage. Uh, in between. Uh, of course, um, in the long run, they would like to have higher wages, but higher wages, of course, have to be uh, accompanied uh, by uh, increasing productivity. And in this case, uh, it's very important that if you raise wages, that goes hand in hand uh, with increased productivity, with increased research and development expenditures. And as you can see from the next um, figure, uh, China, in particular, already affords itself a very high uh, degree of research uh, development uh, expenditures measured uh, as percent of uh, the GDP. It uh, nearly moves into the direction of established economies. The UK, for example, is, is pretty weak um, in this regard. Um, among the Vichy Grand countries, the Czech Republic still is the best with regard to research and development, and of course, um, uh, the amounts of money that China can mobilize with regard to research of development are really uh, tremendous. And on a so far very successful process of catching up very rapidly in terms of uh, technology and of course with productivity development. Um, finally, um, in order to organize uh, this uh, strategy, uh, you have to understand that these economies have uh, uh, a strategy that is fairly protectionist uh, because they assume that um, only, uh, well, they are not yet able to really compete with uh, established uh, economies on top, uh, top level technologies. So uh, they think they need uh, first to develop their own companies, uh, let them become global uh, players. Um, and for this purpose, um, they have a high degree of uh, protection. Um, and uh, here we have again an OECD uh, survey that indicates uh, the level of product market regulation across uh, server economies. Sectors. And again, you see that India and China are uh, the most protective of all of the economies that have been studied by uh, the OECD, even though China, for example, is very important um, as, a, uh, as a market for many Western companies. But still, China only allows foreign uh, exports into the country uh, due, the, due to the conditions imposed by China. And this is even more um, obvious if you look at uh, foreign direct investment. About foreign direct investment. Um, China, again, according to regulations by the OECD, is the most restrictive largest large economy with regard to inbound foreign direct investment, although China receives a huge amount of foreign 
direct investment, but this is due to the fact that China's domestic market is so attractive um, to producers, for example, in Europe or the United States, that they can uh, impose these conditions, so they have very strict conditions, for example, car, as a car producer, uh, you have to be forced uh, to undergo a joint venture, and as you all know, as a vision guard country is among the most open with regards to foreign direct investment, they are to attract foreign direct investment, because that is as a backbone of the economic strategy. So to wrap up, uh, we see two different, very different economic strategies in emerging markets. The one uh, strategy pursued by the Asian developed countries, very open, based on the attraction of foreign direct investment uh, uh, and the like, uh, well, with the risk of giving up uh, control towards foreign companies. And on the other side, uh, the national control strategy is large emerging markets, such as China and India, based on the long-term catch-up process, based on national control, protectionism, state control, uh, domestic uh, tactics. Both strategies have been very successful over the last uh, 30 years, but of course, most strategies uh, have been this in the long run, but this is something I'm not sure to raise in this question. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Uh, what is the uh, broad structural overview and comparison between the two uh, two reasons? Now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Francois, who is going to go and talk about uh, what is just necessary. Thanks. Thank you. behind this new economic reordering is the rise of China. Here again, the rise of China is nothing new. China has, been, uh, has started to rise back in the late 1970s, okay, at the time of the Deng Xiaoping's uh, economic reform and opening up of the Chinese economy. So 
what, what is so new then? It all started a long time ago. Yes, but China has been taking off quite gradually. So at the beginning, back in the late 1970s, the Chinese economy started to grow without necessarily wanting to play much of an official role in the global uh, economy. There was no willingness, no political will associated with the rise in economic power. So at the time, there was indeed a change in the uh, economic balance, but that was really the very beginning of a change. The real beginning of China's integration in the global economy dates back to the early 1990s. So there were 10, almost 10 years between the beginning of the takeoff and the active participation of China in the uh, world economy. At that time, a major step taken by China was to open up to foreign direct investment very forcefully. So at that time, there was the beginning of active, real integration into the world economy. So this started in the uh, early 1990s, appro approximately. And new momentum was given to reform at that, at that time, and through, in particular, this opening up to uh, foreign direct investment. As a result, uh, there was a further shift in the center of gravity of the world economy towards China, with all the uh, direct investment flocking to, towards China. But again, this was simply a change in economic distribution or uh, yeah, distribution of economic power in the, in the world. But again, no political will on the part of China to play an active role. It was just, you know, we, we could observe that China played more of a role, but China itself was not willing to uh, take on a real role. The real turning point then comes in 2008, 2009, with the global financial crisis. This is really what, what I see as a watershed moment. And the, the reason why I see that as a watershed moment is really a time when there was a coincidence between the, the rising weight of the Chinese economy and the rising willingness on the part of Chinese government to play a role, an active role, in the global economic order. And why is it that at the time there was this shift in the mindset in, uh, in the China, Chinese leadership? The reason has a lot to do with the global financial crisis and with the decline, or at least the perceived decline, because it's not necessarily a real decline, in the role of the US, in the uh, quality of the model offered by the West. So at the time of the global financial crisis, there is no denying that the model that had been offered by the West and by the US in particular was perceived as deeply flawed. This crisis was really a cr the crisis beyond the simple financial crisis. It was really a crisis of an economic model. And as a result, China that had been rising for a number of years <laughs> at that time felt that it was the right time to play an active role and to offer something different, to offer an alternative. And so this is why at that time Beijing realized that its economic power could be turned into some, to some extent, a political power at the same, at the same time. And so it, they realized that they could play, that could exert more influence in the world economy. And they also realized that the economic experience that China had been going through could be presented as perhaps not a model, and I will come back on this in a second, but as an alternative to a number of countries in the world, and in particular, of course, to developing economies or to some emerging economies. So they, they, they felt that it was the right time for them to offer this alternative. On the world model, what, what is isn't interesting, I think, is that China itself, or Beijing itself, does not really insist on promoting a model. They don't use this, this, uh, this word. They don't use this notion. And uh, for instance, I know that a number of people argue that the Chinese model is the so-called Beijing consensus, which is supposed to be an alternative to the Washington consensus. But this Beijing consensus was not promoted by Beijing itself. This expression was coined by a US economist. And so, Perhaps it corresponds to a reality, but it was not taken up by China itself. 
So Ch China does not really uh, adhere to this idea that China is a model. What the, wor the word that the Chinese are using to promote this alternative way of working is the word solution. So what they say, they talk about a Chinese solution, but never a Chinese model. That's very Chinese. So Chinese solution. And this Chinese solution is based on uh, Chinese wisdom. Again, that's the, the expression they keep using. Okay, but they don't promote model, okay? But anyway, what, what is for sure is that they came up with the, the idea that China was different and that China could perhaps provide some inspiration to some other economies. And this inspiration departs, of course, from what had been offered before by the US and the West, broadly speaking. So what, what I think is very interesting is that today we have actually the competition between two systems, so, so to speak, even though it's not necessarily presented like this by, by Beijing again, but we, we are faced with this, the competition between these two systems. And in, on this very specific point, I would tend to disagree with what has been said earlier this morning about the, the two cities trap. I agree that we, are not, we may not be faced with a real war that will be waged bef between the US and China. It's not, it will not be a military war, so a real war, but it may be a war of norms, of standards, of practices, and we really have two competing systems emerging. The existing system that had been promoted by the US for a number of years, and the rising, the emerging system that is being promoted by China. So it, is, it may not be ex the exact uh, emergence of this uh, two cities trap story, but it is the new version of this trap. We definitely have a competition between two systems. And this is how I, I see this global economic reordering being played out to, today. So we are faced with a very new situation. And this is why I say this time is different. In the past, we also had the rise of a big economy in Asia, that was Japan. But Japan never tried to impose or to suggest that it could be a model to anybody. So there was no political will on the part of Japan to offer an alternative model, whether it's called a model or not, but an alternative solution. In the case of China, they are indeed offering this alternative solution, and they are actually promoting norms, standards, and so we are faced with this, uh, this choice, do we adhere to this new version, or do we still stick to the old model? So this is what the situation we are faced with today, and of course, the, uh, the influence exerted by China has been in full swing in its immediate neighborhood, and in particular in East Asia in Southeast Asia to be more, more, more specific. And what we see today is a very in, uncomfortable position for these Southeast Asian economies. They don't know exactly where, what to do and where, where to sit. And uh, I know that uh, well, so, some other speakers earlier today talked about this dilemma. And uh, there is the temptation to lean towards China in economic terms and to lean towards the US on security terms. But I'm afraid that if you believe what the story that I've been telling so far, there is no real choice. Today you cannot, the disconnect between economics and politics is not as clear as was the case in the, in the past. It's increasingly blurred. And so the decision or the, the choice is much more complex today. In East Asia, some countries have more or less de well, decided more or less freely, <laughs> to side with China, and this is certainly the case of Laos and Cambodia, for instance, in Southeast Asia. Some other countries are still struggling, and they don't know exactly what to do. They try to, uh, well, play one partner against the other, and they try to, to maintain good relations with the two, the two sides, and this is certainly the case of Thailand and Mal Malaysia in, uh, the, these days also. But my, my point is that I think it's gonna be increasingly difficult to maintain this, uh, this balance between the two partners for the reasons I highlighted before. Really what we are seeing today is the competition between two models and these two models are to some extent or to a large extent incompatible. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot, Francois. So we are getting some pretty grim uh, predictions here. So that's good for discussion. I hope to. Uh, I hope we will get some uh, interesting insights on that later on. Uh, now I would like to uh, give floor to to Rudolf from the Institute of International Relations, who I think is and again going to speak on East Asia, but bring in the break, uh, bring in back the Visegrad countries and Czechia, if I'm not mistaken. So, go ahead. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be here and join this interesting debate and thanks to the organizers to, for inviting me here. I would follow up to, to, to the previous uh, contributions and ideas. Uh, I was inspired by the, by the idea that the, uh, there is a sh somehow a shift to Asia and from the perspective of post-communist uh, Central Europe, I would call this instead a slow boat to China. Why? Because we have a lot of hopes and we, we expect a lot of economic impetus from, from China, but still the results are somehow not, not coming. So for us, China is a, a great perspective for the future, but still the present time it's somehow very... Um, uncertain and e even very dis disputed. Let me start with the beginning. If I compare China and, it, and with uh, East Asian uh, uh, strong economies, we can see one great difference and uh, this is that China is its latecomer. Chinese, Chinese uh, investment expansion started after the year, let's say, about 2000. But compared with the Koreans, with Japanese, with Taiwanese, they knew, they knew very well uh, European terrain and, and in, even they knew the situation in post-communist uh, states, which was of course less known area and maybe for them uh, quite risky. But still, those states were able to develop their business and investment strategies and they became very important. In, uh, economic partners even for the post-communist states. On the other hand, China hesitated a lot because, because poor knowledge of this, of this area. Uh, the Chinese, you know, they have very strong sense for making hierarchies and for sorting out things. And because the small post-communist states were previously perceived as a periphery of Soviet Union after the after the breakup of Soviet Union and, and the Cold War era, we just dropped out from the, from the Chinese perception. So we, f for several years, we actually did not exist. Or, and in case that we did, just as a negative, negative case of, uh, of economic and political transition, especially those in those cases like Yugoslavia and uh, the Soviet Union and, and even Czechoslovakia, those states split after the end, after the, after the collapse of the communism. And for the Chinese, the split of the states, it, this is a great disaster. And secondly, the uh, comparatively uh, successful economic transitions in, in Central and Eastern Europe was downgraded by Chinese propaganda because the Chinese claimed that their own Chinese model of economic transition was the best one. And the negative cases of inefficient uh, uh, liberalization politics in Soviet Union and uh, elsewhere in the former Eastern Europe were just uh, uh, just an illustration of how, how the proper uh, economic policy must, must be conducted. So the image of the post-communist Europe was, was negative or there was an, and the perception was somehow on, on the edge of, of, of ignoring. Why? post-communist states became important in the eyes of the Chinese, of course, because of the accession to the European Union. Uh, if, we, if we look at the structure of, of uh, uh, Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and their regional order, the post-communist states were previously put together with, uh, with East, Asia, uh, East Europe and Central Asia. So that means <laughs> this is like a, a stereotype that we just belong to the east side. And when we dropped to the, to the proper one, to, to Europe now, 
now on we we became important that would that would explain why the for example chinese prime minister for the first time visited prague in 2005 because we we became relevant Uh, and we became relevant, especially due to political reasons, but be because we are small states, but we have the, we, we, we can participate in the strategic decisions in, uh, in the institutions of the European Union, such as, for example, voting for market economic status, or lifting arms embargo, and so. And this is quite very important, and that's why China, China discovered this, this uh, issue that the the small new member states, the post-communist new EU member states must be, must be, let's say, taken more seriously. From the economic point of view, the China discovered the Central Europe uh, uh, recently, and the basic argument is that post-communist part of the EU occupies about one third of the whole European common market, and this matters. So that's why it was the first reason, because China is it's a great um, uh, exporter. And secondly, China discovered the interesting geographical location for their strategic prospects of establishing the trans-Eurasian um, uh, transportation and logistic network networks. If we have a look at the map, we can see we can see new maps of the Chinese uh, Silk Road and uh, one, one Belt One Road and uh, Belt and Road and uh, such the super project that cover cover the uh, Europe and that connect China with Western Europe and the post-communist East East and Central Europe is just in in the middle of the way and the post the 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 place is very strategic because of the of several important transportation lines. The first one is is coming from the south. You know about the uh, Costco uh, uh, lease leasing for 100 years of the uh, Piraeus port in Greece, and China is planning to connect Piraeus through through Balkan states, through Serbia to. Uh, um, Hungary. So, one of the biggest uh, joint projects is the is the railway Belgrade uh, Budapest, and the other strategic roads are between the Russian railway system and between the uh, Baltic states and the and the south of uh, sorry and the northern Europe. And thirdly, the probably the most strategic transportation line is between uh, Russia across Belarus, Poland to Germany, and this road is ending in, uh, in Western Europe, in, uh, depends what, what kind of map you, you just see and what what's, was just issued by the Xinhua agency, but this Ending of the of the Silk Road is actually in Manchester, in UK. So we can see the priority, of course, is Western Europe, especially Germany and France. We have speakers from <laughs> this, those states here, and we small post-communist states. We are just on the way, and and China needs us for the support, and China needs needs this space for for completing the infrastructure system. Uh, Beijing, of course, offered a package of investment uh, uh, investment package for for the infrastructure project uh, about 10, 10 billion US dollars. The pr the problem is that the post-communist states are mostly not seriously indebted, so the Central and Eastern Europe, Europe does not need loans that what we need is, is uh, effective investments, like from, from any, anybody else. And f on the other side, the new EU member countries receive huge, huge loans, and huge structural funds, and hu huge foreign direct investments for individual EU states. So 
So if we if we start regarding China as a serious competitor, we we have to we have to realize that this is not true. China is China is. Uh, is developing its attractive uh, business dream uh, diplomacy but in in specific concrete uh, figures we are we should not be we should not be uh, surprised that the the new established times uh, established ties between uh, china and central and eastern europe uh, is it's actually scarcely relevant china especially china developed its it's a new multilateral format, 16 plus 1. I would suggest that this is, uh, while talking about the Chinese style and Chinese policies, this is new new contribution. China discovered multilateralism, and China is, is able to exploit those multilateral formats from Africa, from Latin America, from uh, the Asian states, and, and even to, to, to design a special, special small uh, multilateral format for for center central europe china calls this central europe but it it fluctuates with calling this uh, identity of individual states because because they are not consistent when they are talking talking about central europe they sometimes mean this is visegrad or it might be even baltic states or sometimes they they call central europe even the balkan states like serbia depends on the social level and and the, and the mood of the conversation uh, my empirical research, which I conducted with my with my colleagues here in Czech Republic and in Poland, and Slovakia, and Hungary, revealed surprising outcomes that that actually the most ambitious uh, members of the of the group of 16 have serious reasons to be disappointed because because the real outcome in terms of uh, FDI and and and, and uh, trade are almost non-existent. So now we face increasingly negative coverage from the Western Europe and from Brussels that that China exploits the, its, its uh, the business policy to to erode the, the European unity and to 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 play and to play the small uh, small European states to or, or use them in in this in this strategy towards Brussels as I I can see that my time is running out. I am I'm able to to explain in more details that unfortunately it is not yet true. But on the other side, we Central Europeans we are supposed to be fair and and inform inform well our uh, partners in Brussels in Western Europe that we know what we do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rudolf. Uh, last but not least, I would like to ask Vladan. I will pass him the. Clicker, and I would like to ask the presentation uh, to go up on the on the screens, uh, if possible. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. So, uh, Vladan, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much. I was given a task by the organizers to uh, critically critically evaluate the position of the Czech Republic in the uh, in the current economic system and uh, give some options uh, for possible future ways. Uh, we will go through this. So first, I will, I will, I will offer this evaluation. I will present several graphs uh, and give some numbers, and then I will, uh, at the end of the of my presentation, I will give you some some options. First, probably the st oh, yes. First, the, the probably the statistics most of you are familiar with. Uh, this is the trade in goods and services. Uh, this is the exports uh, as a percentage of GDP. And what you can see is that since basically since the fall of the communist regime, all these countries of Central Europe, it means V4 countries, Slovak Republic, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, Czech Republic, and Poland, all of these countries have increased uh, their exports as a percentage of, the, of their GDP. And in some countries, uh, most of the, I mean, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and, uh, and uh, Slovakia, uh, from this chart, they appear to be highly dependent on foreign trade. This means that uh, almost 90% in some countries, 90% of their GDP is, uh, is supposedly exported. Uh, Poland is a little bit different because uh, Poland is much larger than those three countries. Well, there is, a, there is one 
quite uh, quite substantial mistake that is usually made uh, when talking about this dependency about uh, when talking about this uh, export to GDP ratio uh, this actually some people unfortunately even some ministers or youth uh, I mean, uh, we used to have some ministers here in the Czech Republic that used this that did use this statistics and uh, and claimed that over 80 percent of or 70 back then 70 percent of G the Czech GDP is exported, which is not true because uh, as this uh, as the second this one uh, as this uh, chart depicts. Uh, Almost half this, this this chart depicts the domestic value added uh, of gross exports, which means that out of this, let's say, 80% of GDP, only half is actually exported, which, which which means that only half of it goes from the Czech GDP. The rest uh, is uh, is a result of the price of import imports. So let's say you import something for 50 and you export it for 100. Your added value is 50. But actually, the, what is counted uh, with the, within the first statistics is the whole price of the export. So actually, the dependence of the, the Visegrad countries on foreign exports is much lower because uh, their domestic value added in gross exports is much, much lower. Uh, so it can, be, it can be about this 40, 50, 40 to 50 percent, except for Poland. Uh, you can also, from this chart, you can see that uh, that the Visegrad countries are very similar, again, except for Poland, which uh, the reason for this is that Poland, the Polish economy is much, much larger uh, than the, the economies of these, the other, other three states. Uh, so it doesn't look that bad uh, when, we, when we are talking about uh, the dependency on the foreign markets still, but the dependency is still pretty high. Uh, this chart depicts the evolution of the Czech foreign trade uh, as a percentage of GDP, and you can see uh, that imports and exports obviously have moved quite long, uh, but within uh, within short distance with each other, but from each other. But you can, what you can see is the growing gap between the exports and imports uh, of the Czech Republic. Uh, the similar charts would be, could be also shown for Poland, Hungary and Slovakia, but the Czech Republic is the most extreme case in this. Uh, from this, uh, it should be quite, uh, I mean, straightforward that the Czech Republic should have a large current account surplus, meaning the Czech Republic should get a lot from the foreign train and accumulate huge surpluses. Well, this is not the case. This is definitely not the case. These are the current account balances of Hungary, Czech, the Czech Republic, Poland and Slovak Republic. And the black line is uh, Eurozone, which is also very interesting. Uh, so, the previous graph would, te uh, would uh, tell the uh, tells this story. Well, the Czech Republic has, uh, has become very successful and uh, the Czech Republic exports a lot and uh, exports much more than it imports. So, I mean, the money that should flow fr from this, the gains, the incomes should be pr uh, very high. Uh, when, it, when we compare this export to GDP, when, do, when we compare this uh, net foreign trade to GDP, we would, we would see that the Czech Republic has trade surplus of some 10%, which is higher than even Germany has. Okay. And which also says one thing that the Czech Republic is actually, when having this having these statistics, uh, is actually living beyond uh, beyond below its means. Okay, below its means. Uh, well, this doesn't show in the current account balance, and the reason is that most of these gains go abroad. So even though we have huge trade surplus, 10% of GDP. The current account surplus is very, very small. Uh, it's, it fluctuates around zero. It got to one point, almost two percent in 2016, but the recent statistics say that it's, it has been going down again. The reason for this is this: uh, the Czech Republic has the, one of the largest primary income uh, imbalances in the world. Uh, the, the important figure is. Unfortunately, the figure you cannot see very well. You cannot see. Oh, 
Uh, okay, so the figure for US, uh, United States dollars per capita. The Czech Republic has the largest outflow of income from the, from the economy uh, when, we com when we compare it to the other OECD countries. Okay, huge income, uh, huge income outflow, uh, twice as large as, for example, Poland, and larger than Slovakia and Hungary. So the Czech Republic is an extreme case. The, the, prim the primary income balance is hugely negative, and uh, these outflows are, are really, really serious. This is the reason why we don't have this, uh, why we don't have any current account surpluses, any meaningful current account surpluses. Unlike Germany, which has uh, their current account surplus, uh, over, that have their current account surplus standing over eight uh, percent, and this is one. Of, and this is the one of the. This is the chart. The other table, which is co which is connected to this, is the the chart, the the table that uh, depicts the profit rate of foreign investment situated in countries. This this uh, graph, this uh, table is from the 2014, and from this you can see that the Czech Republic. You cannot see again. Okay, the Czech Republic, uh, the total profit rate uh, of the Czech Republic for foreign investment is higher than anywhere else. What does it this? Uh, okay, and one more, the last one, net international investment position, which says how much actually do we own uh, compared to how much uh, uh, the foreigners own in the Czech Republic. And this, uh, this chart shows that the, all the Vichyglad countries have negative international investment position, uh, but the situation has been improving a little over the last, over the last several years. So what are, what are we to make of it? First, Czechia, the Czech Republic, is dependent on foreign trade. That is true, mainly with the European Union and is mainly, uh, mainly connected to Germany. Most of our exports go to Germany, uh, but, but also to the other European states. But the severity of this dependency is somewhat exaggerated. Because this, the first figure, 80% export of GDP, is not in, does not tell entirely uh, the whole story. Second one, the Czech Republic public is on a very is on a very peculiar position. Is in a very peculiar position where relative pro prosperity is mixed with huge income outflows. So it is true, the Czech transformation has been a relative success, but uh, the numbers, the officially used, the usually uh, used numbers, uh, do not tell the whole story. Okay. The Czech GDP actually looks better than, than, the, than the income of uh, the Czech households and uh, the current account disbalance, uh, the primary income balance uh, has, has been, is, is, is huge, uh, has been growing. Uh, the Prime Minister has uh, decided to do something about it. Actually, last week there was this meeting of the Czech Prime Minister with the representatives of the main uh, uh, foreign investors in the Czech Republic. Uh, we'll see what comes of this. Uh, I'm somewhat skeptical. Uh, but he tries, he has, allegedly he has been trying, allegedly he has been trying to uh, to convince those foreign investors to, to somehow uh, Keep some of their money in the Czech Republic and do not and do not uh, ship them uh, ship them uh, abroad. Uh, the problem is that uh, the Czech Republic has very limited control over its economic assets. We have already been told that this in the first presentation. However, the most important indicators are rather favorable for more confident sovereign decision making. Okay, so the dependence is not that big. Uh, the Czech for the Czech internet the Czech foreign debt denominated in foreign currencies is very low. It's somehow the, the, the government that denominated in foreign currencies is some 7% of GDP. Very, very low. Uh, so the, the decision making the, the sovereignty of the Czech Republic is there to be taken. The question is what to do with it. Uh, options. What are the options? The first option is to continue the current orientation and hope for, for outperforming the competition. This is quite difficult. Uh, it, I have, I don't know much. Uh, there are no, not that many examples that would succeed in this, uh, but it is possible. Then basically, this is what we have been doing right now um, until now. The second option is diversify the trade relations towards China and U.S. 
more specifically, uh, because most of our trade goes to Germany. Actually, most of the Czech goods ends in China and the United States. But the Germans are the ones who resell them to China and the United States. So uh, we would rather, we, would, we should take the opportunities that those new, the, the, the Chinese or the United, Mar the US market uh, gives us and take them directly. And the third thing, the, th the third option is to decrease the dependence on foreign trade. So focus on more domestically owned economy. Uh, Yes, the, we are able to do it. The indicators uh, are favorable to this, but the question is: uh, Are we able to actually come with some reason, with any reasonable plan? And isn't that too risky? That's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Vladan. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, giving all the talks. I mean, all our uh, panelists uh, are researching this stuff and are publishing extensively on that. So I also encourage you to have a look at some of their uh, papers. If you just Google their names, you will find their profiles on the website and you can have more detail on uh, the stuff that they are working on. Uh, I would now ask them all one common question and would like them to speculate a bit if they wish. Uh, then uh, I would open it up uh, for questions from the audience and uh, I would be very happy uh, for hearing uh, comments and uh, questions later on. But first, my critical question, uh, the most obvious one, uh, what do we take out of it in terms of policy? So, okay, uh, we, have, we have heard uh, uh, some interesting arguments, so basically Andreas has outlined two types of uh, successful catch-up strategies. Right? Uh, we are uh, in a country that represents, together with other Visegrad countries, one of these. And we are talking about uh, the other successful types, so that's quite nice, I think. Uh, Francoise has uh, basically argued that reordering means future conflict, which I think is a meaningful uh, prediction, uh, given a, a lot of circumstances that one can observe in media and in data and so on. Uh, and then we have heard that uh, we are in the middle between China and Western Europe, and uh, we don't need Chinese money from, <laughs> from uh, well, I'm now... Uh, of course, brutally simplifying, uh, but uh, I think um, this is a fair statement. And finally, Vladan outlined uh, some interesting options for where we think uh, we should be going. So I would like to push also the other uh, three speakers, but also Vladan maybe, uh, to maybe try to identify, given what they have said and given how they understand the situation, some intelligent, okay, now this is, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> A high demand, but uh, okay, some uh, some ideas and some proposals for what a uh, country like Czech Republic or others in the region should be doing in these rather interesting interesting times. And if you don't mind, I would maybe go still in the same order uh, uh, that we uh, took for the presentations. I would start with Andreas. Yeah, thank you. This is a very very important, very interesting um, question. Um, as I, as I said in my presentation, um, the model that um, the Czech Republic has been following, um, as the other Visegrad countries, uh, with a certain exception for Poland, is quite coherent. So it's, it's, it has been stable over the last uh, couple of decades and uh, uh, it has performed quite well. However, um, it is it is a risky model uh, in the long run um, because um, not only, as uh, Fladan has highlighted, uh, there are other countries that profit more from this model uh, than the Czech Republic, namely Germany, uh, and, and others that hold assets uh, uh, in the Czech Republic. But there's also always a risk uh, that, uh, that the owners of the foreign direct investment move to other locations that have a nicer combination of qualified labor um, uh, and, uh, and lower labor costs. And, um, this is particularly dangerous if you cannot invest uh, lots uh, amounts of funds in, uh, in your education system. Uh, because you're, um, at the beginning, the Visegrad countries have profited a lot from the high level of qualification uh, uh, during uh, the, the communist period, which invested a lot in, in, in education and the like. Um, but of course, you have to uh, always to rebuild um, the qualification uh, of your workers, and you have to invest a lot in uh, education. And if, for example, uh, you give lots of tax rebates uh, to foreign multinationals, that of course is very difficult to finance. So I think uh, in the long run, uh, the, the, the dependent market uh, model can be quite uh, dangerous. The second danger that I see is uh, uh, in more in political terms, because um, foreign direct investments have very uneven effects uh, on your population. Uh, the people living uh, and, and working uh, on FDI financed projects profit a lot, and they're mainly in the urban, urban centers uh, and the like. Uh, 
Um, but in the countryside, of course, people don't profit that much from these kind of investments. They fall behind in their living standards. And if we look to the recent uh, elections in, in Poland and Hungary, we see what kind of uh, effects this can have, uh, because they are turning to parties that are more critical of these kind of uh, liberal economic uh, model. So. Uh, for both economic and political reasons, I think uh, countries like the Czech Republic uh, may think of alternative options, like Vladan has, uh, has highlighted, particularly the, the last uh, option. And uh, what I find very interesting, but it's only in its early steps, is um, the recent policy of the Polish government, uh, the Mazowiecki uh, plan, so the, the idea to, uh, on the one side, uh, strengthen domestic demand um, by, by redistribution, but on the other side also to have a very strong public investment program program. Um, it is unclear at the moment whether this can really be realized, but uh, the Polish government at least seems to be um, uh, moving into a, a, a direction away from this uh, dependent uh, model to an economy that is a bit more uh, controlled by, uh, by, by the state and by domestic capitalists and is less dependent um, on foreign direct investment uh, and, uh, and hopefully can also keep more profits in the economy. So that would be one, one option. Thank you. Okay, Francois, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Okay, well, uh, I'll come up with intelligent recommendations. <laughs> Try my best. <laughs> uh, no, well, I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm demonizing China. That's not, that's not the point. But I think one of my <laughs> recommendations would be that uh, China, China's approach, and in particular the Belt and Road project, should not be seen as about infrastructure, period. The Belt and Road is really not exclusively about hard infrastructure. The Belt and Road is a lot about soft infrastructure. And this is why what I've been saying about China trying these days to kind of impose its own values, and this is why we end up with this conflict between values or standards, or whatever you call it. So the, through the Belt and Road, this is really what China has in mind. And so my recommendation would be to the <laughs> Czech government to envisage, to look at the Belt and Road Initiative as such an initiative and not exclusively about funding hard infrastructure projects. There is much more to be the Belt and Road than this. So that would be my first recommendation. And, the, and well, in, as follow-up to this first recommendation, I think the, the only possibility for, uh, for various countries to uh, respond to this uh, Chinese wave is to go or play regional or to play multilateral. So I guess for the Czech Republic, again, the, the right approach is either the European game or and or the multilateral game. So that would be my intelligent recommendations. <laughs> Thank you. Rudolf? I would, I would try to do so. Uh, and continue uh, the Czech, Czech position within the uh, multilateral format 1 plus 16 is quite uh, successful. We might be one of those who received some, let's say, uh, uh, investments from, from, this, from this format. What we should do is to, to stay realistic and to cooperate with our EU, EU uh, mem member states, especially we should probably support the common effort for developing the uh, joint uh, uh, FDI screening system because the Czech Republic is uh, enormously focused on the uh, financial services and China identified us as a very interesting country. But I don't think that we are ju just the only ones in, uh, in EU. I would take the example of Austria and uh, Britain and, and the others. We, in, um, in among, among the post-communist states, we are quite unique in, in, this, in this case. But sometimes the, such businesses might be uh, uh, questionable for, in terms of transparency. So that we are very pro Western, and I, I don't expect that we would be easily hijacked uh, to the east <laughs> from the, from our uh, European uh, European place. Thank you. Uh, I will go through all three options quickly. First one, if we let's say let's say that we decide to outcompete the others and uh, regain uh, the international investment position. Uh, well, what should we do? R&D, 
investments in R&D, uh, promote stable business environment, uh, classic neoliberal things, uh, economically econo promote economic liberalism. Uh, it could work. It's unlikely, I would say, but it, it can work. Uh, the problem is that uh, we are too dependent on Germans and uh, uh, Germany has their, they have their current account surpluses which are oh, some 8%. Uh, but uh, these are not sustainable in the long run. For every surplus you have to have somebody who has deficits. And those who have deficits cannot run deficits forever. So yes, the Germans have had huge current account surpluses. But the other countries have had kind of account deficits. And those countries are not in Europe. Those countries are mostly in Africa and uh, some, are, uh, some are in Asia. Part of it is absorbed by the United States of America, but with the new president and his uh, policies, this is, uh, this is uh, questionable how long for, for how long this can go on. So in the future, the Germans will probably try to somehow uh, recollect their debts from the others, from based mostly the Africans, and the Africans won't be able, simply. So we will most probably will have a crisis uh, of in the developing world, and this will be, and, but I'm going to, to, uh, to I'm, I let myself to, let, to be led too much astray. So this is problematic in the long run, and we have already, we have already, we've already heard this. The second part, bilateral relations, uh, and let's say, let's say reorient to China and, and uh, two other markets. So basically, somehow uh, retain the domestic value, added value in the Czech Republic and regain ownership. Uh, this, is, this could be quite uh, complicated in the, in the, within the framework of the European Union. Since there are rules that have, that have to be followed, uh, you cannot that easily support your exporters, domestic exporters, and uh, give them some uh, advantages over other exporters. So it's possible, but I don't, uh, but, uh, I don't think that it would be politically vi uh, manageable uh, in, within the framework of the EU. The third part, the third option, uh, focus on domestic, uh, on, do on regaining domestic ownership. Uh, partially this is doable. It would uh, require two things. Uh, first, again, promote our probably uh, promote. Uh, first thing is promote domestic uh, domestic uh, uh, demand, uh, which the current government has been doing to a certain extent. Uh, the second part is uh, somehow uh, retain the outflow of the of, of incomes uh, of dividends uh, to, to uh, abroad, and uh, actually. This can be done. Hungary shows the way, but I don't know how much, uh, how popular that would be uh, in, in this country. But yes, it could be done. You can tax some sectors of the economy that are foreign, that are owned by, mostly by the foreigners. Let's say Hungary did this with the financial sector, for example. And you could, this way you can, uh, you can keep some of the money back home, and you can do, and you can use those monies somehow productively. Let's say, uh, although this remains to be uh, this is a question if Hungary actually uses this this fund productively. But they managed to get uh, to actually to convince, based mostly by law, uh, to the foreign companies to uh, actually share most of a much larger share of their profits with uh, Hungarians, uh, whoever they, uh, let's say, Hungary as a, as a country. Okay, that's it. All right, I will now open up, uh, but before I do that, to give people 30 more seconds to think about their questions, uh, I will ask one more question myself, and we'll leave it up to the, discuss, uh, up to the panelists to pick and choose uh, from the questions that might come from the audience, or whether they want to address the one I will ask, or whether any, of, any other of these. So just to make sure that there is something on the table uh, before people really get going with their questions. Now, this question, uh, sorry, this panel is called uh, what role for Czechia in the global economic reordering? And I think we have been talking most of the time with some one or two exceptions, basically about China and East Asia. And if I think about the global economic reordering, I'm somehow thinking, what about the elephant in the room? Uh, what about the reordering within the core, within the established powers? It has been uh, touched upon, uh, uh, I think, twice or three times during the presentations. But if no other questions, or if you want to pick up uh, on that one as well, uh, what do you think? How 
how can a country like the Czech Republic in, in this region with its uh, security connections, uh, transatlantic security connections, with its membership in the EU, with its kind of weird position somewhere uh, on the, in the eastern part of the European Union, how can it deal with what's happening in the global trade regime, with, in, the, in the global economic regime, with the change in the, in the core of the formal OECD or whatever, established powers, right? So I'm obviously talking about the United States, but also some other countries changing their policies or changing their overall attitudes towards open, open markets and uh, relatively open and relatively orderly global economic order. So this is just a uh, food for thought uh, if you uh, don't have anything better or if you want to address that, but now I would like to, I would like to open it to people and uh, please introduce yourself and uh, please be critical and uh, uh, I know it's late afternoon but still. I think I might uh, break protocol and perhaps ask... Okay, I, I see one, one gentleman there, one, uh, one lady there and I think I might have seen one, one more hand there. Oh. Yeah. Just uh, a very quick question to uh, Professor Nicholas and thank you very much for your uh, analysis. I think it is quite precise and uh, very much on track. Let me just ask one question though. To what degree do you think the Belt and Road really uh, is in a sense a de facto creation of this new norm set or a conceived strategy? Is it part of in fact de facto grand strategy for China today? Thank you. I think I've seen a hand uh, there on the right. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karolina Liskovcová and I'm from Sciences Po Paris. So, <laughs> um, I was really interested in what... Uh, uh, so, um, I would like to know regarding the like the long-term development of the international order and Czechia's position in this order. Um, if Mr. Hodulak said that we should orient more on USA and China, etc. So in this new, let's say, uh, bilateral order, uh, where should we incline more and how will it look like if, for example, the African countries will adopt this uh, model or, what was that, uh, solution <laughs> uh, in the long term? Thank you. All right, then I think I've seen Tom. Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, very interesting presentations. I have a few questions. Uh, first to Professor Nolke. Um, but also maybe to uh, Professor Nikola. Uh, you're saying that uh, center is moving to emerging markets. Um, in you know, when we talk about uh, declining terms of trade as an important element of uh, the international political economy, um, it has changed uh, in relation to um, well, uh, primary sources to 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 manufacturing. The decline in terms of trade are actually um, related now to the simpler and maybe even not so simple manufacturing as China entered uh, the trade. And um, so, yeah, is the center really moving if declining terms of trade are related to what is produced in these allegedly new center countries? So that is my first question. If I can have a few more, that would be great. Um, to uh, Professor Nelke, uh, you spoke of banks. Uh, obviously, um, oh, mm, uh, obviously, uh, banks are very important uh, in South Korea, Taiwan, and elsewhere, China as well. Um, but we've seen, I mean, there is empirical research that um, actually the uh, foreign-owned banks in uh, Eastern Europe and the European Union uh, did not transfer money during the crisis to their mothers, I mean, these daughters. So um, the banks need not be such a serious problem. That, that is my counter-argument to what you said. Uh, to Professor Nicola, if I can have one more question, please. Um, um, so China has been rising uh, after the Asian crisis. Uh, there was the idea of the of the of the you know East Asian IMF, and uh, the result was uh, Chiang Mai initiative, uh, which is uh, actually very limited in scope and still actually involves uh, IMF 
uh, and the acceptance of the well IMF policies. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think South Korea applied during the crisis to uh, the American uh, Ministry of Finance rather than to these swaps. Uh, so again, again, that questions uh, the idea of uh, the, the movement of the center to, to the east. Um, I would like to ask actually an open, like just an open question rather than a critical one. Um, what do you think of this, uh, what China gaining a bit of percentage of votes in, um, in the World Bank in the recent uh, well, reorganization of the voting system uh, and you know, um, creating the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, uh, but still United States keeping the, the veto. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the audience? Because we would collect everything uh, at this stage and then give the speakers their word. Okay, if, if not, then um, shall we start in the reverse order to make things a bit funnier? Uh, Vladan, do you think you could address any of these questions or would you like to say something? Yeah. I think we have, uh, like I we have like 12 minutes, so uh, let's aim at three minutes each if that's okay with you. Uh, okay, quickly. Uh, uh, the the second option is actually the least favorite, from my point of view. Uh, first, what uh, what I would do is to convince, uh, to actually keep this uh, orientation on Germany, but somehow to somehow try to convince the Germans that we should the EU should be more home domestically oriented. Okay, so so the Germans should play much larger role promoting their their own domestic demand and so on. So this should be the, th the, the first thing. Uh, th this is probably unlikely uh, in the in uh, in this uh, in, in in several years. I don't think that the Germans will change their strategy strategy because their strategy has worked pretty well so far, and it's probably is going to work for another several years. So this is this is the first choice. This, the the second thing I would do is probably tax some of those foreign. Own companies here in the Czech Republic, uh, to certain extents, what uh, what, uh, what Hungary did, and uh, there are two kinds. There are two types. The first is those who export abroad, and I don't think that we should tax them, right? Let's say Volkswagen. We probably should not tax Volkswagen or Toyota or, or these companies, and uh, but there are companies who actually make money in the Czech Republic. So those companies cannot move, and you know, retailers, retail finance, and so on. And there is much, and there are options are much more, uh, much much better. Uh, but there is no politically, the political you know, will to to do this. Rudolf, would you like to address any of that? Okay. Uh then let's go to Francoise. Okay, I have uh, at least two questions that were addressed to me personally, so I'll respond to those first, and then I'll try something about Africa. So on the Belt and Road, is it a de facto strategy, or was it a grand strategy from day one? I think that you can say without any hesitation that it was not a grand strategy from day one. And the reason I'm saying that is that the slogan, the term Belt and Road, or One Belt, One Road at the time, because it ch keeps changing more. Like in Chinese, it's Yida Yilu right from the start, but anyway. So the slogan was launched even before the brainstorming started. So the, and, it, and it's very Chinese. So they launch an idea, and then the idea will be, uh, well, f flesh on up. I don't know, can you say that? Or you, you put meat on the bones afterwards. <laughs> Okay, so it is very Chinese, and I guess it refers back to the Deng Xiaoping strategy of you know crossing the river by filling the stones, blah blah blah, this kind of things. So it's exactly the same thing. And over time, I guess they realize well that it works, so we can expand the thing. And precisely what you see is that the Belt and Road has expanded both geographically. Initially, there was an not very precise list of 65 countries. That was what they said, 65. Nobody ever knew who the 65 were, but they said 65 countries. Over time, it has been expanded to 100, maybe more. 
Now the whole world is part of the Belt and Road. Even the Arctic is part of the Belt and Road, okay? Uh, so there has been geographical expansion and there, there has also been a sectoral expansion, which is why I, I say that it's not exclusively about hard infrastructure, it is, it is about something else. So I, I think that it, it, it has grown into a grand strategy, but it was not a grand strategy from day one for the, the reason I just uh, gave. Uh, of, about the, um, the role of, the, well, the recentering, the shifting of the uh, <laughs> power, economic power and all that, it's true that after the Asian financial crisis, there was uh, this proposal by Japan for an Asian monetary fund. Uh, two countries actually torpedoed the, the project, the US, of course, and China. China was not very active in torpedoing the, <laughs> the project, but it was not very active in supporting it. So at the end of the day, it was torpedoed. Uh, and the only reason why China was not in favor of the project is because it was a Japanese project. Only reason. But it good enough reason for them. Uh, so afterwards, the, the China initiative was launched, and then the China initiative has been now multilateralized, and so it looks more and more like an Asian monetary fund. But this time, China is okay with the idea, because it was initially part of the project from day one. So they agree with it. It is true that Korea did not uh, go to the uh, China initiative, they didn't ask any money from the China initiative, and they went straight to the, uh, to the US. The reason why they did that, it had w to do with history. And it has to do with the fact that the, uh, the China initiative is still very much connected to the IMF, and there was no way Korea would have anything to do with the IMF ever again. They had very bad memories of the, their experience with the IMF back at the time of the uh, Asian financial crisis, they don't want to reproduce that. And so that's why they didn't uh, want to make use of this uh, time my initiative. Well, nowadays what we are faced with is basically a de facto Asian monetary fund. It is still connected to the IMF, but less and less so. And so there may be some autonomization, <laughs> increasing autonomization of the uh, time my in initiative. Uh, but I, I don't know exactly at what when it will, uh, it will happen. Next to that, we, it's true that uh, the role of China, or the, or the weight of China has slightly risen uh, within the IMF, but uh, as a result of the doubling of the quota, uh, the quota, the Chinese quota is now 6% or 6 something percent. Well, it's not very, very large. <laughs> it's far behind uh, the quota of, of the US. So the US sti still has uh, veto power. I'm not sure it's a very good move because it, it fuels the willingness on the part of China to create alternative mechanisms. And so I'm not sure that uh, China will stop its, uh, its effort at building new mechanisms such as the AIIB, even though the AIIB is not the bad institution that a number of people feared. You know, a number of people didn't want to well, join the AIIB, and the US refused to, and Japan refused to, and the reason why they didn't want to join was that they feared that this institution would not abide by the rules, by the usual rules, in terms of so social uh, protection, environmental, blah, blah, blah. And so that, that's why they were so much against it. But it turns out that the AIIB is perfectly, a perfectly clean institution. It actually cooperates with the World Bank. It cooperates with the ADB. So the AIB is a perfectly clean uh, institution. My take on that is that the AIB is the nice face <laughs> of Chinese contribution to international governance. It is just one very small aspect, and the rest of the uh, contribution of China to global governance is precisely the Belt and Road. And this is not as decent, not as clean as the AIIB. But that's my... Uh, I don't know, I'm maybe pushing the, uh, the point a little bit too far. So that's why, what I'm, I think that this, this shifting of uh, economic power is still, uh, again, work in progress. So we'll, we still have to wait and see what, uh, what happens next. So I don't have time to respond to Africa, but I can uh, respond on a bilateral basis. Thanks for that. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Very interesting questions. I start with uh, Thomas. Uh, first, the, the bank issue. Indeed, uh, you're right. Um, many banks have not left uh, the Visegrad uh, countries during the last uh, economic crisis. Uh, that's correct. Although the proof really would be a crisis that affects more or less only the Visegrad region and not the home region of the countries. At that point of time, there was a crisis for in, in, in the other countries as well. So there was not such a clear difference and it didn't really make sense to relocate operations to the home countries. But it, the interesting question would be if there is a, uh, the crisis only in the Visegrad region, not in the, in the headquarters countries, would they then relocate? But of course, this is hypothetical. Um, and I would say, I think there were some, some issues in the Baltics. I think some of the Nordic banks have withdrawn uh, operations from the Baltics. And finally, uh, I would highlight uh, uh, the importance of domestic uh, public development banks. I mean, the KFW in Germany is so important for public policy, uh, which, which uh, if, if there's a new political concern of the German government, very often it turns to KFW for, for some supportive action. Uh, and if you don't have this kind of public uh, banks, you don't have this option. So that's why I think this uh, national control will be important. Um, your other um, point was also um, very, very interesting uh, about the relocation of uh, production. Um, uh, actually, I should um, uh, point out that this is not an observation that I, I have or we have made, but it was contained in the UN Development Program, Human Development Report 2013. I found it very interesting that uh, the center of production in 1800, for example, was not in the US, uh, Europe, and, and Japan, but for example, more in China and India, uh, and now it's returning uh, to the east, so that's quite Quite interesting. Indeed, you have a point uh, that um, this is an uh, observation that relates to production only, not to, for example, to services, which are becoming more important. But um, uh, China is also moving in this uh, direction with payment systems uh, and so on. So maybe that uh, in this regard, uh, this will also be relevant. However, not to be misunderstood, I don't think that this is a zero-sum game. So I wouldn't say that what, what, for example, China and other emerging markets are gaining must be at, the, at, the, uh, at, at a loss uh, to, to the Western economies. I mean, what's a fantastic thing in, in, in these large emerging economies was that they have taken hundreds of millions out of poverty. They have created huge additional demand for the world economy. And from this perspective, I wouldn't see this so, so negative, uh, the, the rise of, of these economies. I think it's, it's a fantastic development and we should be more relaxed and more positive uh, about it. Uh, and if I may, may make one related remark to Francois's uh, presentation. I mean, we also have um, looked at the issue of um, global economic ordering, global economic institutions from our perspective, not a foreign policy, but rather this kind of comparative capitalism perspective. And from our perspective, so far China, India, and so on, are far less aggressive uh, than the US uh, with regard to global economic institutions. Uh, yeah, because the US, uh, they forced through, uh, for example, their standards of corporate governance, of corporate finance, uh, uh, access uh, for minority shareholders, and so on in other countries. China does not export its uh, state capitalist model, as you have said. So I would say uh, China, is, sh we shouldn't see it so, so negatively, at least from, uh, from our perspective. And finally, turning to, to Michael's uh, question, um, uh, what, what is uh, the, the task of um, uh, Czechia in this, well, change away from liberal uh, uh, ordering? Uh, actually, from our research, I see um, uh, a large development uh, in many countries away from liberal capitalism. Uh, you see it in the US, but you can also see it um, in, in Western Europe with right wing populist uh, movement. You see it in emerging markets. So there is a, a move towards something that I would call more organized uh, capitalism. And I think maybe Czechia should, or the Czech Republic should follow this uh, development, not to be left behind alone in the liberal camp. Thank you. This is a beautiful conclusion. I even got my elephant in the room question addressed. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. Uh, thanks a lot for um, uh, to all the panelists for giving their uh, insights to us, for sharing their insights, and thanks uh, to you for staying with us uh, in this beautiful afternoon. Uh, I would just say, uh, I would just like to ask you to give the panelists a round of applause and then enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Okay, thanks.